Okay, so welcome to the Friday morning seminar. So usually we don't have it at this time, but uh, we we always we wanted to hear this special talk. And our speaker today is Amarish Jaswal, who is very well known for his work on technology of heavy ion physics, especially, and and also for hydrodynamics. So today he will talk about uh, hydrodynamic attractor and its observable consequences. So over to you, Amarish. Thank you, Ayan. Thank you very much for inviting me. And inviting me. And I was looking forward to give this talk. <clears throat> so I will get started. Good morning, everyone. So uh, what I will talk about today is uh, attractors in hydrodynamics. And I will also propose uh, some observable consequences in heavy ion collision. So what, how do we even you know, plan to uh, say that there, there might exist an attractor. Uh, uh, volume, system. I can barely hear, Amrish. I can barely hear you. I'm sorry. Let me, uh, Ayan, can you hear him properly? Yeah, I can hear, but the volume is also less. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, yeah. I maxed out on my <laughs> this and it still didn't. Exist. How about now? Can you hear now, me now? Very good, very good. Now it's perfect. Now it's good. Now it's perfect. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so huh. <clears throat> right. So basically, what uh, what I will be talking about is uh, how do we actually characterize the attractors in hydro equations, and then how do we plan? To, how can we really even hope to observe it in heavy ion collision observables? Okay. So I will get started. So basically, what I will uh, do is I will. Uh, start with the simplest causal theory of relativistic hydrodynamics, and then we will go through different variants of it, higher order hydro theories. And we'll consider a, a very simple case of Kalframmel plus Bjorken uh, expansion. And we will, for this simple scenario, we will look for the up attractors, so the, the, the quantities which characterize the attractors in, in, in hydrodynamics. Uh, so fixed points, Lyapunov exponents, and all these things. And we will look for, so these hydro equations, these high, higher order hydro equations that we have, we will look for approximate analytical solutions. And then once we have the analytical solution, we can try to find the attractors analytically from the hydro equations, okay. And later on, I will discuss about the observable consequences in heavy ion especially thermal particles collection. Okay, so the simplest uh, way in which we can include dissipation in hydrodynamics is relativistic navier stokes So what I will do is I will, from the very beginning, specialize to energy momentum tensor written in the Landau frame. So we will have a set up a conformal system where there is no bulk pressure bulk viscous pressure, and then uh, you know, the dissipation is only due to shear, okay? And we also don't consider any charge conservation. So basically, it's like a photon gas. Okay. So for such a system, uh, if we look at the energy moment tensor, then the dissipation is purely due to, uh, due to shear stress tensor, which in the navier stokes limit takes this particular form, okay? Uh, this is, the first order relativistic navier stokes in landau frame okay and that is a causal that leads to an uh, that leads to a causal signal propagation in the medium and this has been known to be a causal for a long time until uh, there are some recent developments in the field where the first order theory is made causal by giving up on the landau frame and matching conditions uh, but that's a different story so we will not go there rather what we will do is we will try to Cure the causality problem by introducing a term which makes the constitutive relation a relaxation type equation. So what it means is that uh, the the Navier Stokes equation, which tells you that uh, the Navier Stokes equation is just the, these two terms here in for the shear stress tensor. Okay. So this tells you that as soon as there is a gradient in the in the system, there is a velocity gradient. Immediately we have a shear force. That's a uh, that the effect is immediate. Okay. This term in red, this makes the theory relaxation type. So it, it introduces a time scale in which the force relaxes to its Navier-Stokes value 
with a given time scale. So that restores causality. That was the Maxwell Catania law, which was given by hand. But uh, we are now, now we know how to derive these equations from fundamental microscopic theory. Okay. So, so let's take this uh, simplest Maxwell Catania law and consider. Uh, so I will I will explain what Bjorken flow is in later slides, but. What I, what I want to say is that if I, if, you, if I were to solve this in a very uh, specific case, of a very specific exact expansion, we get these equations for energy density evolution, epsilon is the energy density, small pi is the uh, eta eta coef. So basically it's one component of the shear stress tensor. Okay. And that, uh, the evolution of that, that is the only independent component that survives in the shear stress tensor. And the evolution of that is given by these two equations from, uh, from the hydrodynamic equations that we have. So these two equations uh, in, in this simplest Bjorken boost invariant setup, which is one dimensional expansion, one plus one, but since it, now it's a boost invariant then the, it essentially becomes zero plus one. So in that expansion, these are the two equations which governs the uh, evolution of the hydrodynamic quantities. Okay. And what one can do is one can simply play around with this shear stress tensor, component of the shear stress tensor, energy density, and write some normalized quantities. So this pi bar is a normalized quantity, which is uh, normalized with the epsilon plus p. The shear is normalized with energy density plus pressure. And then we also have tau bar, which is normalized with the relaxation time. The, the proper time is normalized with the relaxation time. In, in terms of these quantities, we can also define something called pressure anisotropy or, or it, it should be actually the pressure isotropy measure. So basically this tells you that uh, how, what is the, this ratio between the longitudinal and transverse pressure. Okay. So, uh, uh, Amadesh, can I ask something here? Uh, yes, so this tau P in your equations, do you assume it to be a constant or it depends on the temperature or in some oh, in, temperature in the conformal or something? Case, Yes, in the conformal case, tau pi that we have here is actually, it has the dimension of time problem. Yeah? This is the relaxation time. For conformal case, there is only one energy scale. That's the temperature of the medium. Okay, so tau pi has to go as one by temperature. That's, that is, there's no other way around. Okay, no, yeah, I just, uh, I was just checking if you, if, uh, if you are, okay. So in that case, the tau pi will be also evolving with time. Yes, it's not a constant, exactly, it's not okay. a constant. But the conformal case, it's, it cannot be constant. If we bring, if we make it constant, then we introduce another scale in the uh, theory by hand. Okay, we will see that uh, we will actually do that at some point, and we will see the consequence as well. In this talk, I will, I will also consider that case where we make it a constant. Okay, so uh, so then uh, let's look at this uh, energy evolution of pressure anisotropy as a function of proper time. Okay, and these are differential equations, so we can solve them with some given initial condition. Okay. So I have, I borrow some slides from Mike Strickland. So here you see this PLPT, the evolution of pressure anisotropy as a function of proper time uh, tau, not the scale one, just, just proper time tau. If we initialize it at some certain temperature, 500 MeV uh, with some eta by S 0.2 or, or different eta by S. Okay. So you get, basically you can see here that you get you know, different evolutions. So they, this, this PLPT saturates to some, essentially it has to go to one, okay. But both, both of them will eventually, because the system will finally equilibrate, so the pressure isotope will vanish. And this is what it shows, but they don't really uh, go in the, in the same, you know, the, the approach is not very, not identical, at, even at later times, okay. So what we see is that, um, although it does go to, uh, I mean, it has to go to uh, one, uh, it, the pressure anisotropy has to vanish, but it is not very, uh, you know, as, as I mentioned, that these, these are not identical approach to equilibrium, yeah? But if you plot it against this, this quantity, tau bar, here he calls it the blue bar, this tau bar quantity, you, you can see that it's, the approach is identically, identical at very later time. So this is some hint of universal behavior, which we call evidence of an attractor. Now, which solution is the attractor is something which we have to decide. So out, out of all these, since they all converge together to go to equilibrium. So we have to, we have to really specify the attractor here. 
which one is do we call the attractor okay so i will also talk about that in the later slide how to fix how to fix the attractor solution okay so for the maxwell catania theory you can see that uh, we have uh, the attractor like behavior this black curve is the attractor solution in both pi bar as a function of tau bar as well as plpt as a function of tau bar and this is obvious because plpt is just a function of pi bar so if it, if it's in pi bar if there is a attractor solution in the pi bar you will also have one in the plpt the pressure isotropic so, and it turns out that this attractor exists for all causal hydrodynamic theory not only maxwell catania but also the recently formulated first order causal theories or second order dnm i mean variants of second order as well as third order theory so for all causal hydrodynamic theories we will have an attractor this is the this is the general feature so so, so let me quickly by navier stokes you mean the a causal one navier by the by navier stokes ha the green that navier stokes here is the a causal navier stokes okay yeah. thank you okay so so what what is important to notice is that uh, they do converge to navier stokes so the navier stokes solution is not the attractor here because all the other solutions with different initial conditions they converge to attractor first and then they go to the navier stokes solution so, so there is a attractor which which act which is uh, which is the solution that in the black is the one to which uh, other initial condition solution correspond to other initial condition converges faster compared to the navier stokes they, they do converge to navier stokes and then the navier stokes or, uh, or solution will go to zero eventually for pi bar for example but that is not our attractor solution and okay, you have not told us how you get the attractor equation that particular yes. black line then. yes I, i will go so i this is just a motivation i will yeah, yeah. okay no 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 problem. problem no problem yes okay okay so <clears throat> let's first uh, before we move on to attractor well, let's first uh, derive this variant of uh, the maxwell catania so theory which we uh, put by hand essentially so we would put this relaxation time term by hand in the navier stokes so what one can do is uh, i i i mean this can be derived from uh, you know from various ways what i i specialize in work in high kinetic theory derived hydrodynamics from kinetic theory so i will just outline the approach that we follow so we write down the energy moment tensor in terms of the distribution function and the dissipation the shear stress tensor can be written as a correction to the distribution function around the equilibrium so delta f is correction to distribution function Around equilibrium, F zero is the equilibrium distribution. This, this this is the phase space distribution function. Okay, and then what we can do is we need to calculate this delta F. So we can use the Boltzmann equation. We can take a simplifying simplified form of the collision term in the Boltzmann equation. This is called the relaxation time approximation. Doesn't really matter. We can actually start with a more complicated form and still solve and get the expressions for pi mu. But the only thing is that doesn't it it doesn't lead to much insight the only thing is calculations are uh, complicated but the tense the structures of hydrodynamic equations remain same the transport coefficients may change slightly okay so now this what we can do is we can calculate the corrections to del to to the uh, equilibrium distribution function up to any order in gradients by just solving the boltzmann equation uh, iteratively okay so these are the solution these are the delta x we can obtain and then we can we can just put these in here for this expression for pi mu nu and we get these equations for shear stress tensor you see we do get back that term which we wanted to have which restores causality in the navier stokes and uh, this is the dn the second order theory which we call the dnmr theory this dnmr stands for technical name von der rieske they derived this question for the first time and uh, then what one can do is one can uh, if so there are these two terms you see uh, the last two terms one can in principle drop this and still have a causal theory okay and uh, also this last term in in here the minus 4 by 3 pi mu theta this last is my cursor visible yeah yeah okay yes yeah. so this term is important to have a conformal symmetry okay so this we call the minimal causal conformally symmet symmetric you know equation for uh, shear stress tensor so we will call this mis and this is actually equation with them uh, this is identical to what muller uh, theory what first proposed 
So this is the minimal causal theory uh, for conformally symmetric systems. So we have up to second order, we have a variant of, uh, we have DNMR, we have MIS. And at third order, we can also derive equations for third order. And this we have the, we will consider the third order equations as well. So the terms in the red are third order equations, look very complicated, but then it, it takes us a very simplified form in the Bjorken expansion. So we will look at, look into that. It actually, uh, it is important to have this third order term because, you know, it can, it, first of all, it leads to uh, improved accuracy with uh, kinetic theory. Causality claim is not really true. I, I should have changed this. So the causal, it's not true, but for Bjorken, it's fine because the term which can potentially violate causality uh, does not survive in Bjorken okay, from the symmetry argument. So Bjorken, it is fine, but in general, it's not causal. That's, this has been proved recently. But one Mish, cannot... how do you prove something is causal or not? I mean, yes, this is a very interesting question. So the way we do it is we can, what we can do is the simplest way is that we take the, we take a hydrostatic, uh, we take like a fluid in the, in a bucket and then we dis put a disturbance on the, in the fluid and we see whether the, these equations that we have, they lead to a causal propagation of the disturbance. So, so this, this disturbance will be propagating inside the fluid and that propagation should not exceed the speed of light. That is how we check causality. So this is the simplest thing. So we, we, we consider hydrostatic and these are the equations which will determine how the perturbations propagate in the medium. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, so Amadesh, uh, is it numerical then in some sense? Yeah, sorry? Is, you solve these things numerically to check this? Or? No, no, it, it, it need not be. So numerically, the, if, if we have a causal theory, numerically it will lead to numerical instabilities. But the way we check for causality is that we, we perturb it and then we look for the dispersion relation corresponding to the propagation ah, of the okay, perturbation. Okay. Okay. And from there, we can find the group velocity. Yeah, yeah. We check that it oh, so you just linearize and check? Yeah, yeah linear perturbation, right. Linear okay. perturbation. Okay, then there's no problem. Uh, so, so, Amadesh, uh, typically this uh, violation of causality happens by high momentum, right? Violation of causality uh, happens at, sorry? Uh, at high, high momentum. Yes, yes, that's right. And, uh, uh, but still it is important when, because when you are numerically simulating uh, the full nonlinear theory, you still require it to be causal. And yes. uh, now, Usually, also this uh, restricts uh, parameters like tau p and all to be for satisfying certain bounds. Otherwise, mm, yes, uh, yes, that's right, that's right. So the, there is there is certain restrictions on the on eta we don't have, but on type tau pi we have. On tau pi we get a restriction which uh, indeed puts a uh, for causal. But then uh, actually the restrictions which is put on tau pi, uh, we never have. Uh, I mean, there's no fluid. Is observed which violates that restriction. So, so it's a, a robust one in that sense. Yeah. So, if you if, so so in the with the third order theory, it is modified from the second order, like it's sort of first order one. Or if we or yes, uh, actually, what one can do is the one can uh, like like we we put a causality destroying term in second order. What we can do is one can consider so these, these kind of terms, these are the terms which actually leads to uh, no, this, these two terms, for example, these 4 by 35 and 12 by 7, these, these terms, they actually lead to a violation of causality in, uh, in even in third order terms. So what one can do is one can define an independent variable, which is space-like space -like derivative of shear stress tensor, and write again an equation for, so suppose I dis define these three rank, this as a three rank tensor and write the equation for evolution of this, then things become causal again in third order theory. So that uh, theory cause group has been working on and I think they, they will have an article soon on archive or somewhere. So, so this is the, actually, uh, this problem is, uh, so they, they show that there is an issue in, of causality in uh, third order theory and it could be solved. And they propose a solution as well. Okay. Ah, I see. Uh, however, I see. these terms that I pointed out do not contribute in Bjorken. So really, when we are going to study uh, attractors in Bjorken, uh, we should not be really 
worried about it because they don't contribute. These terms basically vanish because of symmetries of Bjorken expansion. And then um, what? Then there is no causality violation in Bjorken. That's okay. 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 Thank you. Thank you. So uh, I will quickly explain the Bjorken flow. So the idea is uh, that we have a we have one plus one so expansion in one dimension along z, for example, and uh, other variable is time. Okay. However, there is a symmetry. So symmetry is that there is a boost invariant symmetry. So no matter which boosted frame. You look at the fluid; the fluid expansion looks identical. Okay, so that boost invariant symmetry uh, results in longitudinal velocity profile v z to have this form z by t. So this is uh, the symmetry of boost invariance. Okay, so because now we are working with the in two one plus one dimension with a symmetry, what one can do is one can get rid of one of the variables in the independent variables in the equation of motion. So, if we were to make a transformation to proper time and space time rapidity tau and eta s, then eta uh, the dependence on dependence on eta s can be completely removed because of the expansion, most limit expansion, and the and we have only dependence on the proper time. Okay, so this is the full equation for all these three variants of causal theory: MIS, BNMR, and third order. This the equation looks the same. Only the coefficients you see will take different values depending on which theory we are looking at. Okay, but this is the full equation that we have. Okay, so what we can do is now we can look for solutions of this equation, these two equations, the evolution of energy density and shear stress tensor. We consider a conformal system in the sense that uh, in our case the conformal system just amounts to uh, putting the equation of state, which is energy density equal to T P or essentially the uh, the speed of sound is one one third. C squared is one third. Okay. So so the, the general form of the equations we have here, and for all these three cases, we can solve it. Uh, numerically, it is easy to solve. Uh, it's ODE. But we also look for analytical solution. Now, analytically, in the most general case, it's not so easy to solve. So what we can do is we can make a change of variable, uh, tau bar and pi bar. We saw that. We, we observe attractors in the previous uh, slides. I showed that if I were to plot pi bar as a function of tau bar, you see attractor like behavior. So, what we can do is we can make a change of variables from tau and pi to tau bar and pi bar. And we get these two equations. One thing to notice is that the equation for pi bar in terms of tau bar is now completely decoupled from energy density. So, there is only one equation we need to consider. The differential equation for pi bar as a function of tau bar. These coefficients a, lambda, gamma, these are all constants. So really, what we manage to do is these two equations. We can actually, by making a change of variable, convert it to only one equation for evolution of shear stress tensor as a function of proper time, scale proper time. So now, taking this, what one can do is one can uh, perform a series expansion. In one by tau, uh, performing a expansion in one by tau is actually uh, performing expansion around uh, equilibrium yeah, because this one by tau bar, this essentially is the root cell number. Okay, so basically we are expanding around the root cell number, and taking this series expansion and performing a linear perturbation around this around this solution around this series solution. Okay, what we can do is we get how this linear perturbation around the solution, how it behaves as a function of tau bar. Okay. So what we see is this exponential factor. The power law is uh, uh, important in some context, but not really here. It doesn't matter because we are doing an expansion around the uh, hydrodynamic uh, fixed point. I think I'll talk about that as well. About hydrodynamic solution, about hydrodyn around the hydrodynamic equilibrium is what we are doing because we have expanded one by tau bar. This exponential is interesting. So what it tells me is that if I perturb the solution uh, delta, so if I perturb the pi bar solution, then it relaxes back as a uh, exponentially. Okay, and this uh, this is a very you know well known theory. I mean well known stuff in 
theories of chaos, where basically it, it, this corresponds to a negative Lyapunov exponent, which means that the the, 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 the stable point around which the solutions converge. Okay, and this is uh, the Lyapunov exponent, the, the, the factor which uh, the numerical factor we call Lyapunov exponent, and that is minus three by two in this case. Okay, so this is for the most. So we have managed to derive the Lyapunov exponent for the most general case. So we have not made any, any approximation till here to get the Lyapunov exponent. Okay. Now what we will do is, we will also look whether we can get this, uh, the same Lyapunov exponent for all the three cases of um, MIS, DNMR, and uh, as well as third order. So the point is, this was indeed uh, for the most general case, what we do here is we consider an effective MIS theory. So this, this here, what we, we do here is that uh, the effective MIS theory tells me that we can uh, just solve this equation, okay, in, in power in, in series of one by tau bar. And the coefficients that we get, uh, this has been well known that the coefficients di you know, diverge factorially, there is a factorial growth of the coefficients and therefore the series is asymptotic and so on. We are not going into that. The only thing that we want to do is that this, this set of this equation, MIS equation can be effectively reduced to uh, this equation here, which is easy to solve analytically. And wh why, we can, why we can reduce it uh, here in this form because we have ignored the nonlinear terms. Okay. Uh, this nonlinear term in the expansion we've ignored, and this, uh, this ignoring this one can get an effective MIS equation and its solution, which still has the same Lyapunov exponent as you can see, minus three by two. So this turns out this seems to be a robust value of for the Lyapunov exponent. Okay. The next thing is we will look for the fixed points in the Bjorken equation set of equations. So fixed point is defined as uh, a point at which if you if the evolution arrives at this point, then it will not move away from the point. So, so during the evolution, if, if the temperature and shear stress tensor obtains a value which corresponds to the fixed point, then it will not move away from that point. The evolution will not will just stay there. Okay. What it means is that then uh, the derivative of temperature and pi bar should vanish. Both derivative vanishes. Then whatever we get is the fixed point. Okay, then because there is no gradient, it won't move away from there. So given that, so we just need to set the left-hand side to zero. What we arrive at are three fixed points, these two, as well as the third one. The third one is actually unphysical. It leads to, uh, this, this lies in the range of negative temperature, okay? So this is not really interesting. It, we don't really have negative temperatures. So we ignore this third point, and these two points are the one where one of them corresponds to attractor fixed point and the other corresponds to unstable or the repulsor fixed point okay so we will we will see what this means in the context of evolution uh, okay so th these are the two fixed points which is readily obtained the third one we don't consider for the time being. so here we what we do is so this uh, attractor then is at zero temperature Ah, okay. So, attract uh, because T is zero, right? I mean, yes, yes. Okay, I see, I see, I see, I see. Yeah, yeah. They, they, it corresponds to zero temperature, and pi bar is this pi bar plus, where these are the values in terms of the coefficients, and again, stuff. Yeah, in 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 this in this plane, in this uh, three dimensional uh, space, temperature pi bar and tau, we have these values. Isn't, yeah. uh, I am uh, Amarish. So usually, if you do not consider these terms, the third order terms, at late mm -hmm. time the pi pi bar is expected to go to zero, right? At late time, pi bar is expected to go to zero. Yeah. Uh, so I am confused because at early time, uh, mm -hmm. that the temperature is supposed to diverge. So yes. when, what do you mean by this fixed point? Uh, right. So this is this tau. Okay. So what we, we should be having is uh, in the plane of pi bar versus tau bar. This is, one should notice is this is not pi bar versus tau bar plane. This is the full 3D of temperature 
fiber and tau so in the fiber versus tau bar plane you will uh, if, at, if you if you take tau bar going to zero the temperature will diverge okay uh, or, or but what we have here is this tau is not zero here it's at some tau okay this so you see i i agree that uh, if you take tau going to zero the temperature should, should diverge but this is not zero tau okay yeah yeah so i'm what the problem getting confused by because pi bar seems to be a constant right is it a constant yes. or not yes yes pi bar is a, is a, is a constant this is a function of constants yeah but uh, it shouldn't it be a function of tau i mean this no these are the fixed on points. that tractor yes so these are the fixed points so fixed points are uh, not fixed points are not function it, it should not move the 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 fixed points right. are the, yeah So the fixed point is not the attractor itself. So this is why I'm getting no, 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 no. confused. No, 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 no. Okay. So the idea is that in here we don't have attractor. Attractors are solutions. It's a it's a trajectory. Okay. Which uh, in in loose words, attractor uh, connects the the free streaming fixed point to the hydrodynamic fixed point. The free streaming stable fixed point to the hydrodynamic fixed point. This is a solution. There is only one solution which. joins these two fixed points and that we call the attractor solution attractors are not points in the plane yeah okay uh, so this uh, lambda is a second order transport coefficient is it or lambda is second order this? yes and a is the first order a is the first order yes. yes 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 and uh, so if so if i take uh, uh, so usually this uh, uh, your this uh, if you if take lambda to zero then it goes to the so, so called uh, heller stansky result uh, mis kind of result that is yes. related but to a a to gamma and gamma is again the uh, tau tau uh, the the conformal factor of tau yes. right yes, yes 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 tau p yeah okay yes. so so then it go back we go back to the usual result and if lab, on the other hand if uh, a is zero but lambda is only lambda is there then it goes to zero one of the fixed points becomes zero becomes right? zero yeah yeah but that is a going to a is the first order uh, coefficient yeah of course yeah so yeah, yeah. Uh, so suppose if the first order coefficient is zero and only lambda is there so you go to the one of this attractor one of this uh, thing becomes zero and uh, uh, and that uh, is that the attractor also or that's the uh repulsor so so out of these uh, sorry out of these two points the i i think the positive one corresponds to yeah the positive one corresponds to attractor the negative corresponds one corresponds to attractor yes the negative one corresponds to repulsor yeah repulsor but the repulsor. positive one goes to zero when a goes to zero when a goes to zero yeah but then the so what is, no is yeah okay yeah So I'm saying that in that limit, is there anything special happening? Because then the pi bar evolves from zero to zero, because the hydrodynamic fixed point is also zero, right? And uh, it's at a very I late see. time. I see your point. Yeah. Uh, do we do we get something special in that limit? Yeah, yeah. That's what I'm asking. Yes. Okay. Uh, this uh, I have not checked. I don't know if Sunil is here. Sunil, do you have to check this? Do you know? Okay. Uh, okay. I have, I have I have not checked this. I don't really uh, <clears throat> in that limit because a is the first order one, the coefficient which appears due to the first order term, and setting that to zero is something which. No, I'm just talking hypothetically in that yeah, limit yeah, yeah, when yeah, yeah. a becomes very small. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. So if there is something interesting happening. That Compared to the second order, term. you know there is okay, also anyway. condition on A. It cannot become very small. Uh, I think that is set by causality constraint as well. Yes, I thought so also. But I don't know about the causality constraint in presence of lambda. So yes, yes, that yes, also I might change. So yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, I haven't. We don't really know. We because we didn't. We don't play around with A. A remains fixed, and the gamma, lambda, and chi are the ones which. Changes for you can see the changes gamma lambda and chi the changes for different variants of the theory we keep it fixed so we haven't really checked that but that's a good thing you can check this.
Okay, thanks. Okay. So uh, here we show uh, a comparison of uh, different attract attractors. So the dots are exact RTA attractors. So we have this RTA uh, uh, relaxation time approximation kinetic theory. What one can do is one can find the attractor for Gherkin expanding. So we can solve the kinetic theory for Gherkin expanding system. And then we can find the attractor for, for the kinetic theory itself. So what we have is, this is the exact attractor for kinetic theory. And therefore the equations which we derive from uh, kinetic theory uh, should also, so if we are doing a good job uh, of deriving hydro equations from kinetic theory, then the attractor should come closer and closer to that. So here I, sh I show different uh, theories. So Navier-Stokes of course is, uh, does very badly, but MIS, DNMR and third order, there, there seems to be a systematic improvement. So, from MIS to DNMR and DNMR to third order. And there is another of A, A hydro variant of uh, hydrodynamic equation, equations, anisotropic hydro formalism. That seems to do the best job out of this. But uh, the formulation that they have uh, is not in, in not in the way that we derive hydro equations. So, so, they, so it contains, uh, so, so the philosophy is a bit different for A hydro framework. So let's not. Amadesh, uh, yes. so you want to say that the third order is something like an optimal trans truncation? If you want huh. to do. No, no, this is. Yeah. So you see, we know that uh, the gradient expansion is asymptotic. Yeah. So there would seem to be, you know, there should be a convergence. So as we increase the order, there you would you'd find like this, you know, we are going to converge towards the, the exact result, but then it. it that's how the asymptotic series work. It seems to converge fast and then it diverges, yeah. So finding which is the optimum, I, probably we have to go to fourth order and fifth order and, and, and we have to increase the order unless you see, you know, you see that there is a convergence and then it starts diverging. So there you have to truncate. Which so recently in ADS-CFT, people are claiming, I think seventh order or something like that. That's okay. uh, optimal. I see. Anyway, uh, okay. Yeah, but but the seventh order, uh, these calculations are a bit di difficult because uh, when we have third order calculations for the most general case, that itself becomes very challenging. Now, uh, what you can, what one can do is one can calculate, one can obtain equations for seventh or any order in hydro, uh, only for Bjorken. It it is easy because there is only one parameter to you know, expand. But uh, doing it in the most general case is a bit tricky. So this equation which I showed here is the third order general equation. So th this can be solved for Birkin case, but this is the most general equation uh, for, of course, conformally symmetric chargeless case. Okay. Actually, the optimal truncation will change depending on how, where the parameters lie. If you have multiple parameters, there's no, I don't think Ayan, there'll be a, a, you know, definite answer third order is good. Depends on I your see. application, you gotta check how the coefficients change. I completely agree. It will depend on from which microscopic theory you're trying to build your uh, hydro. Yeah, yeah. But uh, when you talk about the attractor, that's a unique mm -hmm. initial condition. So for the attractor, there seems yes. there could be an optimal truncation, which is well defined. Yeah, yes. for a general initial condition, of mm -hmm. course, it will depend on that specific initial condition. Right. For the attractor itself, yeah. Yeah. Because you can have the exact RT attractor too, right? Yes, yes, yes. And yes. yes. Yeah. So uh, what now we will do is, uh, as I promised, I will show how to at least try to obtain analytical solution. Of course, we have to make some approximations to that. So this is the exact differential equation which got separated from evolution of temperature. So this is what we have, this equation is what we have. And the form is uh, of able differential equation. And analytical solution to this equation, if we have, then we have basically solved higher order hydro. Uh, for Bjorken analytically, okay. So we don't, uh, we are we are not able to solve it actually. Solving a differential equation is another ball game altogether. But what we can do is, we can try to find solutions. So this is the one which uh, I and you are asking. What what if we put it equal to constant, the relaxation time? Yeah. So if you put it equal to constant, then this equation that the previous equation which I showed you here, this take a very simple form. This, this this form can now be solved. Okay, this is the Riccati equation, 
and a solution to Riccati equation, equation exists in terms of special functions. Okay. So what one can do is one can write the solution in terms of, so I'll, I will write them down as, uh, in, in a unified way, but let me do, discuss two other cases. Case two, case two is where we take for confirm a system, the relaxation time should go as one by temperature. Okay. Now that only in the relaxation time, this, temp this temperature here that we have, what we can do is we can take the evolution of this temperature from ideal hydro. So this ideal hydro, you can solve the temperature for ideal hydro, you can solve. And this is how it behaves. The evolution, uh, the temperature evolves for, so this, this all it tells you is that there is a expanding system. The time, uh, temp the proper time is the only, only parameter which, uh, which leads to the expansion. And therefore uh, it goes at one third of power, tau to the power of minus one third, the temperature uh, falls according to this power. And what you get is, if I, if I take this evolution for temperature in the relaxation time only, okay, not everywhere, just in the relaxation time to replace, instead of taking tau pi to be constant, I replace the temperature evolution from the ideal hydro evolution. Okay. Again, the equation reduces the same Riccati form. The third case is what we can do is we do the same thing. We, we take the temperature evolution from Navier Stokes. So we can, of course, we can go one step ahead. And we, this uh, Navier Stokes is also analytically solvable. So we know how temperature evolves with relativistic Navier Stokes equation. And we put that in the temperature evolution for one by T of tau pi. Okay. So if we do that, the equation also again reduces to Riccati equation. And for all these three cases, the solution can be written in most general form here in terms of the Whittaker functions, W and M. Okay. So these are the, uh, this is the solution analytical approximate, not exact, but approximate analytical solutions for, uh, for pi bar, the shear stress tensor, as well as energy density. Okay. And once we have this, you can see that uh, these are the parameters. To, the blue is the independent variable. And then for these three cases, uh, lambda, capital lambda is the Lyapunov exponent. Okay. So for these three cases where we take tau pi to be constant or one by ideal temperature evolution or one by navier Stokes temperature evolution, we get different values of, uh, well, for the last two cases, we get the same value, but for the constant, relaxation time, the Lyapunov exponent becomes minus one. We know that it should be minus what, three by two. This is the, this we already know from our linear perturbation analysis. So, so what we see is that by introducing, so when we set relaxation time to be constant, we are introducing other scale by hand. For a conformal symmetric case, there's only one energy scale, the temperature, okay? Once we introduce another scale by hand, that messes up the Lyapunov exponent here. And this is what uh, we see, but, but as, as long as we keep it as one by temperature and take the, take the evolution from lower order equation of motion, we still respect the Lyapunov exponents. The other values changes a bit, but the, the, the Lyapunov exponent remains the same. Okay. So actually uh, what, so what we do is by taking the evolution from uh, ideal or navier Stokes equation for the temperature, we see that uh, the, we are doing a, Know, a more accurate job. Okay. So, huh. so this this is the this is the plot where I where we show the evolution of pi bar as a function of tau bar for different initial conditions. Okay. Now you see, if I were to suppose you know let's take tau bar equal to one. Tau bar, at tau bar equal to one, I initialize my system. Okay. At different different values of pi bar. At tau bar equal to one, I initialize for different values of pi bar and evolve. You see that it will converge to the attractor. This is what was shown in the very beginning uh, of the slide. Now what we do is using the same set of equations, we evolve it backwards and see where the, where the solutions go when tau bar goes to zero. Okay. What we see is they all converge to only two points. The attractor goes to one value. So it starts at a tau bar equal going to zero, it, it, it takes only one value, one value. There's only one solution is, which comes out from this particular value, which is around 0.25, okay. 
and all the rest of them essentially converge to the other point. This is, these two are the ones which were the uh, you know, attractor and repulsor fixed points. The first one corresponds to the attractor fi fixed point pi bar plus, which we had, and this is the pi bar minus, the repulsor fixed point. Okay. So, so the, all the evolution, which starts from, so, which is not the attractor, will all converge to, he, to this point, the repulsor fixed point, when we go backward in time and we uh, look at tau bar equal to zero slice. Okay. So these are the two, two fixed points. The attractor solution corresponds to the uh, correspond to the the, uh, the solution which joins the stable fixed point, stable free streaming fixed point to the hydrodynamic fixed point. This, if, if I go more further in time, tau bar, you will see that this uh, this black line approaches zero. Pi bar goes to zero essentially, which is the hydrodynamic fixed point. Okay. There's only one. This is how we characterize the attractor. This is how we define the attractor. So, so what, so what, what we can do is given we have the, given we have the analytical solution, okay, I should have mentioned that in the analytical solution, the alpha here are the constants of integrals, okay, and that corresponds to, they, they encode the initial condition values. So, if we change alpha, we are essentially giving different initial conditions to pi bar and temperature, right? okay. So, they correspond to different initial condition values. So here, okay, what we can do is we can, we, we can, to determine the attractor, what we do is we say that the derivative of the pi bar, the solution with respect to alpha, okay, the point where, uh, essentially, so we define that as in the limit tau bar going to some tau zero. If we set alpha equal to alpha zero, let's call that this quantity psi, okay. So then, the attractor solution corresponds to diverging psi equal to infinity at tau bar equal to zero. Okay, when alpha zero is zero, this is what in, in the analytical solution. This is what corresponds to the attractor solution in the analytical expressions that we have. Okay, so this is this is the attractor solution for the most general case, and it is of course independent of the initial condition alpha because uh, we have fixed that. Okay, the attractor solution corresponds to one initial condition. Okay, and the Lyapunov experiment can also be similarly obtained by take, taking the derivative of pi bar with respect to alpha as well as another derivative tau bar. Okay, uh, and Lyapunov exponent is in the limit of so this is in the limit of high, in the hydrodynamic regime. Okay, so we take tau bar going to infinity limit. Oh that, that of, yes, sorry, sorry, there's somebody else to. So, so then we get the Lyapunov exponent as well as the fixed points from the analytical solutions that we have. So how do we look for observable consequences of attractor? Okay. So in, in heavy ion collision, we know that when two heavy ions collide at alternative velocities, we have QGP which is formed. Okay. And that involves hydrodynamically. And uh, the hydrodynamic equation that we use here is relativistic hydro equation. And this has to be dissipative in nature because uh, finite viscosity was sort of proposed and also experimentally you know, verified that indeed we need some amount of viscosity to reproduce the data that we observe in the detectors. Uh, and so therefore, this seems to be a nice avenue to check whether we we can have, you know, in, in this QGP evolution, whether we we uh, the hydro the attractor which which are present in hydro hydro equations can be checked in the QGP evolution. This is something which uh, seems uh, reasonable to expect. That can we can we propose some observable sign signatures in the relativistic heavy ion collision uh, experiments? Okay. So then for that. We have to have uh, observables which are sensitive to the entire evolution because what comes out, what comes to the detector, are two types of signatures. One is where you know, there is a there, there is from the the matter goes from deconfined phase to confinement again in the hadronics. They form hadrons. That is a final state observable. So they, they all forms hadrons in, in a very towards the end of the evolution. 
and they are detected in the fireball. And then there are thermal particles like black body radiation of from QGP. Okay. And they are able emitted throughout the evolution of QGP. So thermal particles are actually sensitive to the evolution history of the firewall. Okay. So, so and those are dielectrons and photons. So dielectrons are essentially basically off shell off shell photons, which uh, which pair produce into uh, two dielectrons. And then we have uh, real photons, which are on shell photons, which are observed in the detector. And one what one can do is one can try to see if the spectra of these two particles, dielectrons and photons, are they uh, do they do they behave differently for attractor or, or not? Okay. So, and uh, what was also observed is that these spectra of thermal particles, they are they are actually sensitive to non-Euclidean effect as well, the dissipation as well. Okay. So this is what we performed. What we did was, uh, yeah. So before I go into that, let's. So we have to have one evolution equation, which which we can sort of narrow down and take that as a Guideline. So what we do is here in this in this plot we compare the three cases MIS, DNMR, and third order, okay, with the exact attractor. So we plot error here. So essentially, we have these approximate solutions, approximate analytical solutions. How far are how badly they do? So that's what we plot here as the error uh, with respect to you know different theories as well as different approximations. Okay, so we see that the third order. Uh, solution with tau pi as one by t ideal performs the best. The error is all, almost of the order of one percent. Okay, the rest are not. Rest don't do so good. So what we do is uh, to observe these photons and dielectrons. We take this third order equation with so the solution which corresponds to third order equation with tau pi equal to one by ideal temperature evolution. Okay, so this is what we take to study the dielectron. And photon production. Okay, so so this is thermal dielectron rate which we can calculate from again from the fact that you know there are q q bar annihilation. So starting from the distribution function of one quark and anti quark, the annihilation process can be written in terms of the cross section, the relative velocity between them, and the energy moment conserving uh, delta function, and the integral over all. Uh, over these two initial particles actually give us the dielectron rate. Okay. And one can incorporate the viscous effect via the correction to the distribution function f here. So, the, so delta f. And delta f one can take from uh, the approximation that we used, this Chapman and like iterative expansion. So we take this and we calculate the dielectron rate. Similarly, one can also calculate the photon rate. So photon production rate, we can. We include the Compton scattering as well as the QQ bar annihilation. This corresponds to annihilation part, and this is the Compton scattering part. And this uh, can also be written in terms of the distribution function for the photons. Okay. And here also, again, we have the correction to distribution function via dissipative correction, essentially, viscous, viscous correction. Okay. So, taking all these, then we have to, so taking these. These two rates we have to uh, we have to integrate over the evolution because what is observed in the detector is the total uh, dielectrons and total photons. Okay, so we have to integrate over the full evolution history of the QGP. Okay, and this is what we call the spectra. So this is what is an observable quantity, and this is what we calculate and see what we get. Okay, so for dielectrons, of course. Uh, for dielectrons, it's a, it's a it's also a function of dm square, so invariant mass. We have to fix that invariant mass. So the invariant mass corresponds to the mass of this off-shell photon, which decay, uh, which basically uh, produces to two uh, leptons, lepton anti lepton. Okay. So what we see here is that the blue curve corresponds to attractor evolution. So this is the rate. Okay. I should say that uh, in the y-axis we plot the ratio of dielectron yield in the in the not in the full 
So this ratio, so this divide, this scaled by the ideal evolution. So if there were no dissipation, so this is just to see how much you know on top of ideal evolution we get a correction. So this is just a baseline. So we take the baseline to be ideal hydrodynamic evolution, and then we take the ratio with that, and that is what we plot on y-axis as a function of pt, the transfer momentum. So what we see is that the for the attractor solution, if we, if we calculate the dielectron yield corresponding to the attractor solution. We get the maximum number of dielectrons. Okay, repulsor corresponds to the minimum number. Of course, at some point we hit a negative field, which is uh, unphysical. But that is purely because our uh, our you know rate equations don't hold so far out of equilibrium. So we have the rate equations that we write down here. They actually hold near equilibrium. Okay, so this is the negative fields corresponding to repulsor or other conditions are not really physical because we are trying to push our formalism for rate beyond the uh, limit in which they are valid okay but the key thing to notice is that the attractor corresponds to leads to maximum yield of dielectron similarly for photons here also we on the y axis we plot yes so is there any understanding why this is the why this is this result is true yes so i i will i will try to oh, inject okay. here something yeah so for photon yield also uh, we have uh, the same thing so we see that attractor it, it leads to the maximum part maximum photons okay so okay one thing that i should mention is that this uh, is for all solutions which don't violate the weak energy condition so which doesn't lead to negative energy densities throughout the evolution only those solutions solutions are 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 shown here okay and that is the reasonable uh, thing to ask so we don't throughout the evolution we don't have at any point of time negative energy density so for all those solution we have maximum yield of thermal particles on the attractor solution okay uh, amarish yes. uh, i mean maybe uh, here you are using hydrodynamics so it could be unphysical but in the yes. full quantum field theory uh, and negative energy densities in some pockets is not that unphysical right in quantum field theory no but for uh, for uh, hydro once we have you know in hydro it is unphysical i guess unphysical yeah so this so i i agree that for quantum field theory it's not a not that's not a problem but i, I see I but think, yeah but here you are only assuming third order hydro so with the statement only within that context that you no no actually we checked for all of them uh, so one can actually take the uh, we can check we check for all of them it uh, i just show here for one case which we see that you know it's uh, the most uh, accurate one but this this is true for all i mean rather what one can do is one can take the kinetic theory and find this find this plot one can take the kinetic theory uh, yeah, but still kinetic theory also in kinetic theory also in a negative energy density will not be feasible Uh, because oh, uh, it's a classical. Yes. Yes. Should not have a negative energy density even in kinetic theory. That's only a because that's because we are considering you know classical kinetic theory. This negative energy densities are I I don't think allowed classically. There. Yeah. They are not allowed classically. But I think people have studied in ADS CFT kind of heavy ion collisions. People have found uh, uh, negative energy density, and basically they've also seen that. Uh, They they are places where you saturate the quantum null energy condition, not the classical null energy condition, but the quantum version of. I see. The classical the classical energy classical null null energy condition says that your uh, plus plus component has to be always positive. Right. Uh, but uh, that can be different. In, uh, but okay. But this is as uh, I was just trying to. The reason I was asking is that uh, uh, if if you believe that one can also see if you have a reason to. I believe why it should be true then one mm -hmm. can also probably make a make some so if you can find for example the attractor in the full quantum field theory for some some way right. then one can also try to make a claim about that irrespective of uh, this energy condition oh, i see yeah yeah that's right ah, so if okay. we can mm, that's a good point actually so if we can make a claim irrespective of uh, energy condition violations and so on then that will be even robust But uh, yeah, in our in our setup, I think uh, we cannot have negative. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So if you understand in some way, like entropy in terms of something else, 
Then right. perhaps, yeah. Okay, and yeah. So okay, so so the why why we uh, why do we expect harm? So what can be the reason that we have uh, maximum particle production on attractor? And this is this we suspect is of course this needs a proof that the attractor corresponds to uh, maximum entropy production. You know, solution the solution along which we have maximum entropy production. Now this is something which uh, we are working on. And the idea is that, you know, why we say maximum entropy production? Because, you know, there are more particle degrees of freedom that we observe, which essentially tells us that the, the system has more entropy along the attractor line and that attractor solution. That is what we think uh, may be the reason, but that needs a proof. So this is what I hint, say here, that is hint of maximum entropy production along attractor, but this needs a proof. So let me summarize. So what we saw is that for all causal theories, we have attractor, and then we compared that to various hydrodynamic theories, and we looked for analytical solutions and different uh, for different hydro theories with Björken expansion. And we proposed how to uniquely determine attractor from these obtained analytical solutions. Yeah, so because numerically there are different ways of doing it, but analytically we can propose some robust way of obtaining the solutions, the attractor solutions. And Lyapunov exponents also, we, look, we, we saw how, what, what is important really, what matters is the symmetries is what determines the Lyapunov exponent. And if we break that, if we violate there, then we do not really land up with the correct value. The thermal particle yields seem to have some, so of some significance for attractor solutions. So what, what it means is that, so, 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 okay, so the idea is the following. For a given, let's say in, in the heavy ion collision, for a given centrality, this is a very common thing people talk about. So for a given centrality, we can consider all events in which, uh, we can consider all events in given centrality. And then we say that the event in which we have maximum dielectron of photon yield, that event corresponds to, so that event evolved via, or, or at least closer to attractor evolution. This is what we can at least, you know, this is what we can, so, so then we can pinpoint that particular event in which uh, we have maximum dielectron of photon yield. And we said this, this at least evolved close to attractor, maybe not exactly on attractor, but close to attractor. Okay. And uh, of course we need another, uh, another observation which can, you know, so this is, we single out that event, but then another, another observation which also says something about that event would be interesting. Then it would be uh, a clear signature that we have a solution, which have, we have an evolution which is evolving close to attractor solution. And that that needs so okay. So what what I can what we can do is that if we have a maximum dielectron yield, of course we have two 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 signatures, dielectron and photon. So maybe they complement each other in, in that sense that both of them are maximum at on the same evolution. That maybe corresponds to that actor evolution. And the hint it basically hints at maximum entropy production along attractor, but we need to really provide a proof for that. And this is very interesting and emerging you know, area of research and many of us are in, interested in that, including I am. So yeah, thank you very much. Thanks for this great talk. Uh, uh, so the first comment I wanted to make is Shantani just left. Maybe Shantani can prove it for ADS CFT also. <laughs> sure, thank you. That uh, ADS CFT people have found this attractor explicitly and, but I don't know, I mean, finding this uh, entry production is a feasible thing to do, but it may not be that, uh, at least in this Jorkin case, maybe one can try to see whether you're, yeah, it's a very in interesting claim, I think, what you're, what you're making, yeah. <laughs> I see. Okay, so any further question? Okay, uh, seems, uh, uh, seems not, then let's thank Amadesh again and for this great talk and, uh, and then uh, have a nice weekend, all of you. I stop recording. <laughs>